Good evening and welcome to the uh, Anglo-Bolivian uh, Society. My name is Winston Moore and I'm chairman. We have with us Kate Ford, who is um, um, who's also vice chair and uh, a membership secretary, and Alberto Subiron, who is our digital media secretary. And of course, we have with us, we're delighted to welcome um, Marion Morrison, who's going to give a very special presentation uh, today, um, presenting the film Land Above the Cloud that she made, which was made by uh, Tony Morrison. Now, I just, uh, her husband, I just want to add also that this year we, the anglo Balloon Society celebrates its 30th anniversary. Um, it was, um, it was launched in May 1992 and the first AGM was in October 1992. And I also want to add that Tony Morrison presented Treasures of Chukisaka, which is another film, in November 1998. I would now like to introduce um, um, Kate Ford, who is going to uh, give an introduction and the presentation will be by Marianne Morrison. Thank you very much. Over to you, Kate. Hello. Well, good evening, everyone, again, or good afternoon and indeed good morning, as I think we have listeners in what the viewers in California as well. Unsurprisingly, we have a worldwide audience for today's event. And we feel very lucky that Marianne is here to introduce the documentary Land Above the Clouds, filmed by her late husband, Tony, in 1967. I know a lot of people who are watching have known Tony and Marion for years, working and traveling with them over the course of the, the 50 years they spent crisscrossing Bolivia and Peru and Brazil, filming and writing and campaigning for the people and natural history of the regions then threatened by indiscriminate export of skins and live animals and that were to be threatened by road building and deforestation later. And if, as if all this crisscrossing weren't enough, throughout this period, Marion continued her work for the National Union of Students, compiled a South American picture library with tens of thousands of images now digitized, and wrote 50 educational books on the land, people, history, culture, and natural history of the countries of Latin America for publishers in Britain and the US. And the anglo bolivian Society is proud to claim a bit of Tony as well as what Winston said about the presentation he made in 1998. He was a council member some years ago, and part of our logo is a drawing of a car carving of Viracocha at Tuanaku, taken from a photograph of Tony's. As Alberto said, you can ask questions at the end by using the raise hand button or if a question occurs to you during the screening, you can type it into the Q&A option. Um, and we will try and fit in as many questions as possible. So over to Marion, thank you. Thank you, Winston. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Alberto. And hello everyone, both from home and so many from overseas. It's lovely to have this opportunity to be able to present this film. So to tell you something of our early filming work in Bolivia, Tony first visited uh, Bolivia in 1961. He was with five other students. They were on a round the world expedition. It took 13 months. And they were concentrating on rural villages, projects, rural villages in both India and Bolivia. The university had apparently insisted that they did some kind of worthwhile projects uh, rather than simply driving from A to B. And in Bolivia, they studied a social program called Axion Andina, which was run by the United Nations to help Aymara and Quechua peoples in different parts of the country. Initially, the team were based at Piliapi. It's an old hacienda close to Lake Titicaca, but they also went to different bases outside Aurora, Potosí and Santa Cruz before arriving back in the UK late in 1961. The following year, I arrived in Bolivia. The National Union of Students in London had launched a volunteer program called Graduate Service Overseas. It was very similar to Voluntary Service Overseas, and I was lucky enough to be one of three volunteers sent to Bolivia. And as it happened, two of us found ourselves working for Axion Andina, based in Piliapi. Did we know the boys from Bristol? Was almost the first question the team asked in Piliapi. No, we replied, we didn't and actually had never heard of them. 
For my friend Jackie and I, Pili Api proved to be a fairly raw experience. The hacienda not far from Titicaca was exposed on all sides, was extremely cold, there wasn't any heating, just one bathroom for a staff of about 20, and food was generally limited to thin soups. So it wasn't surprising that we headed into La Paz quite often, but it was something of a surprise when later in the year, we bumped into two of the boys from Bristol, Tony and his colleague, Mark Howell. They'd got a contract to make several films in Peru, Bolivia and Paraguay for a new series, BBC series called Adventure, which had been dreamed up and was produced by David Attenborough. Now, at this point, I'm going to try and share the screen as I'd like to show some photos. Right. Hopefully you can see this photo, um, yeah, which is of Tony and myself. It was almost the first photo taken of us in La Paz soon after we'd met um, and was taken in, in effect really to just reassure our parents that um, everything was okay. So in the next couple of years, while I continue to work for NUS in London, Tony and Mark returned to South America to make more films. They covered many topics, including the peoples of the Andes and their way of life, especially communities around Lake Titicaca, the ruins at Tiwanaku, the mysterious Nazca lines on the coast of Peru, the Incas, Machu Picchu, Jesuit missions. There was a search for treasured gold in Sacambaya, and one film which uh, uh, I put there, Winston mentioned earlier, which was the treasures of Chupizaca which captured this extraordinary version of uh, Guadalupe and Sucre Cathedral and the deserted old colonial silver towns of Southern Lipes. Most of these films were 30 minutes long and in black and white. By 1967, now married, Tony and I set off for South America, this time to make two films for Anglia TV survival series. One was to explore the fishing industry and the effects of the Nino on the birds and wildlife of the Peruvian coast, and the other was land above the clouds. We knew we would be driving hundreds of miles in the Andes, so decided to ship a Land Rover out to Peru. Tony was to fly out, and I was to take our other equipment out by ship. The first leg was by ferry from Harwich to the Hook in Holland, and luckily, a friend was with me. She was heading for a teaching job in Santiago. And between us, we managed some 17 pieces of luggage. I was actually charged overweight on the ferry. And that was the first <laughs> and last time it's ever happened. We then took a Dutch cargo ship from Amsterdam for some 25 days at sea, including for our relatively small ship, a thrilling village, uh, sorry, a thrilling passage through the Panama Canal before hopping down the Pacific coast to Lima, where I met up with Tony. Acclimatization is an obvious problem if you're working in the high Andes, but we were fortunate that we'd had pre some previous experience of this. So soon after arrival, we headed slowly by road up the Peruvian coast into the mountains, where there was a particular lake at almost four and a half thousand meters, where we hoped to find giant coots, torrent ducks and flamingos. This is the lake, we camped alongside this lake, and as you can see, it was pretty cold, and we had to be up before dawn to get the gear ready and locate ourselves in the best possible place to film. Tony used a Bolex 16 millimeter camera, which had 200 or 400 foot spools, which when they were full had to be changed quickly, especially in the middle of a sequence. And that was never easy with fingers, which were really numb with cold. From the outset, we knew we'd taken on quite a challenge and that Anglia Survival would use only the best and exciting footage. Most of their programmes had been shot in Africa with its spectacular landscapes and wildlife. And in one instance, amazing footage taken from a hot air balloon. Our problem was that there was no large animals in the Andes or Amazon, no vast herds. And though, and though the cloud and rainforests are spectacular, they are difficult locations in which to work which was why one of our first objectives was to seek out the condor, native to the Andes, 
and after all, the world's largest flying bird and the largest bird of prey. We first tried our luck with some success on the Peru coast where the condors feed off dead seals. Watching this huge bird in flight, relying on thermals to stay aloft with barely a flap of its wings was an amazing experience. We also filmed festivals where the condor is celebrated, not always kindly, and as you'll see in the film, sometimes hard to watch. In the 1960s, people were waking up to the threat worldwide to wildlife and the environment, and World Wildlife Fund was founded. We worked closely with them in both Peru and Bolivia. One animal that was of great concern in both countries was the vicuña, small relative of the llama and in great demand for its fine wool. Having been a sacred animal under the Incas, who instead of killing the animals arranged for regular shearing, numbers had decreased alarmingly through poaching and the animal had become endangered. WWF became involved and as a story it fitted neatly into Land Above the Clouds and we followed the herds high in the mountains and across the Great Salt Lakes in southern Bolivia. Fortunately, the Vicuña story did have a happy ending and the animals are no longer in danger. We spent many months in southern Bolivia around the great salt lakes of Ayuni and Coipasa, where we had the world virtually to ourselves. For these journeys, we carried our own petrol in drums and jerry cans, food, water, spades, shovels, tents, sleeping gear, and large flagons of Undaraga wine, which were easily available in the La Paz market. Much of the time, the, we were over 4,000 meters, Temperatures often dropped to minus 10 at night, occasionally lower. Driving across the salt lakes was particularly hairy. The Iuni Salar covers some 4,000 square miles, and below, water is several hundreds of feet deep. In those days, there were no proper routes, just tracks where the occasional contraband lorry had driven to Chile. And it was known that some of these trucks had disappeared without trace below the surface. Away from the salars, often there were places where roads or paths simply petered out and we'd find ourselves driving over rock-strewn surfaces, ever conscious that to break down would be disastrous. I have to say that Tone was a superb navigator. I did most of the driving so that he could film and somehow he always managed to get us back heading in the right direction. In this photo, you can see that there's no obvious route through the taller bushes. One destination, destination, a must to find the world's rarest flamingo was the extraordinary Laguna Colorada, which surrounded by extinct volcanoes has to be one of the world's most spectacular sites. Sorry, Marianne, uh, to interrupt, but we got stuck with the first of your photos. I don't know if you can move to, to, to show the others. Well, I've got, but... the, I've got the Laguna Colorada on, on the screen here. No, we have the first look of, uh, here that it is a, basically you and and and, and, and Tony, the, the first picture. It really? Got, yeah, yeah. It got stuck. So there. I, I'm I'm able to run through them all here. Do you want uh, me to stop sharing and start again? Yeah. Yeah, can you reshare again, please? That any better? And uh, now we can see all the pictures. Yeah. But but it's not in full screen like like before. But it is alright because people can see the, the the image. I have so, got it. I've got it in full screen on here. Now we're where? Yeah. Can you go to the next one? Is it working or? Yeah. Well, it, for me it is. Okay. Here it's not working. It's some problem with the. We apologize for that, but it looks like it's a streaming problem rather than. Do you want me to try once more? Yes, please. Huh. 
now we've, yes. we we are seeing uh, an image uh, from yeah now now it's moving it's it's working now okay do you want me to run back through them then i mean that that was obviously tony on the salar yes yeah us driving trying to drive through taller bushes yep yep they're going to cut it out there yep pick it up actually there's only one more after a couple isn't there one more yeah <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> sorry. right. It's all right. Anyway, yeah. the lake doesn't always look this red. Um, it depends on the, the day and the light. Um, and this is obviously Tony filming there. And you can see um, he's really geared up because it is actually, you know, really was very cold. Um, and it was always what one was a very inhospitable place, actually, in which to work. And I was reminded by one friend um, that Tony uh, used to make me wade into the icy waters here to ensure that the flamingos, <coughs> sorry, flew in the right direction over the camera. And he stood on the side and watched. Um, anyway, another ex expedition that we made was um, in the west of Bolivia, uh, close to the Chile border, uh, to the remote Chipaya tribe um, who live a truly a desolate existence on the edge of the salt flats and we got stuck in this area so many times and Tone is obviously doing his bit here to try and get us out. Less than a thousand Chapaya <coughs> had survived from a tribe that was once widespread in the Altiplano um, and they weren't really particularly friendly towards strangers. We managed after a degree of bartering to film their flamingo hunt which you'll see in which they use bolasses to catch the flamingos. But we actually, we were quite relieved um, when time came to leave the village. <clears throat> but it was on our way back from Chapaya that we had our scariest encounter with the military police. Um, Bolivia in those days, 1967, um, the, the army was hunting down Che Guevara, che Guevara and his guerrilla group. Um, and anyone who looked even remotely suspicious was as best questioned and at worst imprisoned. Well, we certainly did fit that bill. Two gringos, Tony usually with a beard, both of us looking a mess, a right hand drive Land Rover and lots of suspicious looking gear. So on the road to La Paz, we were overtaken and stopped. An armed militia man indicated for us to wind down the window looked at Tone and said rather menacingly, ah, Antonio Morrison, you are the man we want. Then we were promptly escorted back to their military headquarters in Aurora, where we were detained, questioned, our gear extensively searched, and only after many hours of trying to explain why we were there and what we were doing and urging them to contact the British Embassy were we allowed to leave. So, during all the time that Tone and I worked in Bolivia, we made great friendships and received incredible hospitality. And I'd like to take this opportunity to just thank two families in particular, because they did so much to help us. Uh, to Alan and Lydia Shave in La Paz, and to Peter and Wendy Williams, respectively in Canada and Australia, I really would like to say a heartfelt thank you. Countless times we arrived on their doorsteps, dirty, disheveled, hungry, having driven for hours and hours, and we were always welcomed. And often in Alan's case with, you've got 30 minutes to get washed and changed, so-and-so has got a party on tonight and you're invited. After Land Above the Clouds, we made other films for BBC TV, including in Peru's Amazon, the creation of the Manu National Park, highlighting the illegal export of animals, and in the Falkland Islands, people and the wildlife, and we were lucky enough to witness and film the salvage of Brunel's SS Great Britain. Great Railway Journeys in Peru and Lizzie, the film to which you have a link, I believe, tonight. And after many other projects, we made our final trip to South America in 2013, 50 years since we'd met there. And fortunately, some of our old friends from the 1960s were still there to help us celebrate. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy the film. Thank you very much. Now we are going to begin to watch the film. Thank you. 
the biggest bird in the world, the condor of the high Andes. It's a huge vulture whose air-gripping wingtips are separated by a 10-foot span. They're not only the biggest birds in the world, they're the highest flyers too. These condors are soaring 20,000 feet up among the Andean peaks. They are kings of all they survey in this land above the clouds. This strange little visited land isn't all towering peaks. Between two vast mountain ranges, there's a high coal plain called the Altiplano. The plain stretches for hundreds of miles. It may look fertile, but it's not a particularly hospitable place to live. It suffers from searing, freezing droughts. The central Andes of Bolivia and Peru contain every kind of natural grandeur. Yet, it's a hard place to make a home for both men and wildlife. Perhaps because the living is so harsh, the condor, with his freedom and grace of movement, is an obvious subject for reverence. The dancer, flapping the condor wings, is saying that the great bird is the king of the Andes. He lords it over the rest of the animal kingdom, and over dancers dressed in many different animal skins. Sometimes the condor plays the starring role in a far more barbaric rite. This time, it's a live condor. The condor is still king. He takes his macabre triumphal ride on the back of the bull, introduced 300 years ago by the hated Spaniards. He symbolizes the Indians' contempt for their ancient persecutors. bull will finally be killed, and the condor, if he can still fly, set free. The condor looks down, in fact, as well as fantasy, on his animal kingdom. King Condor's subjects are often as bizarre as the settings in which they live. There's the vicuna, an animal that looks like a cross between a deer and a camel, but is far nearer the latter. It's a wild llama, and of course llamas are close relatives of the camel. There used to be great herds of vicuna, but a coat or bedspread made of fine vicuna hair is worth thousands of dollars. Even the altitude and the wildness of the mountains can't protect these graceful animals from ruthless hunters. Today, they're to be found in the highest and loneliest valleys of the Peruvian Andes. The government is trying to pass laws to protect them, but in the remote Andes, protection is just a word, not a deed enforced by law. The vicuna share the lonely slopes with gay owls the rare Andean deer. Today, more and more guns are finding their way into the Andes, with the usual tragic results for rare and common species alike. Luckily for the deer, they can climb like chamois. Man and animals have always been closely linked in the Andes, particularly where superstitions are concerned. In the witch doctor's market, the dried embryos of llamas are sold as powerful charms against failing crops, sickness, and evil spirits. They're sold for sacrificial burning. 
Llamas were the most important domestic animals until the Spanish brought in horses, cattle and sheep. The Spanish also introduced the Catholic religion. Today, the sacrificial altars built on the hilltops owe more to the earlier pagan beliefs. The people of the Andes never really recovered from these early tyrannies. In ancient times, their only defense was to escape to the least accessible places. The Aymara chose the great Totora reed beds of Lake Titicaca. Lake Titicaca lies at 12,000 feet. It's 100 miles long and the highest lake in the world with its own port. The Aymara believe that the great god Contiki Viracocha arose from its depths to create the Aymara and the fish and fowl on which they were to live. If so, Contiki left them a slender legacy. The Aymara are among the poorest people on earth. The tribe have found a way of using the Totora reed for every possible purpose, even for building fishing boats. The great reed beds form a spawning ground for fish and a natural home for all kinds of water birds. Titicaca has Andean as well as Peruvian flamingos. Giant coots squabble in the shallows. They're just like our own coot, but about three times their size. A full-grown Titicaca coot is nearly as big as a small turkey. These birds can fly quite well when they're young and slender, but as adults, they seldom bother to get airborne. Where the reed has been cut, a young night heron fishes, as patiently as any Indian and a good deal more successfully. Puna teal find good pickings in the shallow water beside the reed beds. Crested greaves are common throughout the Andes. They build their nests on reeds, just like the Aymara. The flightless grebe is rare and special to Titicaca. He has to be. How could he possibly go anywhere else? All these birds are still present in fairly large numbers. Even so, they are not nearly so abundant as they were just 30 years ago. An Indian population starved of protein isn't too fussy about delicate flavors. So grebes, herons, egrets, duck, all find their way to market where they're sold for about a shilling apiece. Once the Aymara only hunted birds for food, now they found there's money in hunting for market. To reach the birds, they cut deeper and deeper into the reed beds with disastrous results, first for birds and eventually for the Indians. They have always cut the reed to provide a floating island home, but now there are signs that reed products are becoming a minor local industry. In some ways, this is excellent, but it's not so good when the reed beds are demolished wholesale with little thought for the future. Finding enough to eat is a constant problem for the Aymara. So they rear ibises as a kind of living larder. Pathetically small fish dry in the cold, bright sun. Fishing is an obvious way of getting protein, but here again, lack of thought for the future is against the lake dwellers. Some time ago, the government stocked the lake with trout. But poachers from the towns dynamited both trout and native fish. So a haul of tiddlers like these is rare these days for the Aymara fishermen. Lake Titicaca and its thinning reed beds may soon become a major conservation problem. The fishermen cannot be expected to see this. Only when the birds and fish have almost disappeared is he likely to worry. In the near future, 
there could be little for the Indian or the egret to hunt. The Indians obviously have as much right to make use of a natural source of food as the very birds they hunt. But in man's case, hunting is only justified when it is properly controlled. It looks as though it might be very difficult to ruin a wilderness as large as Titicaca. But the feeding and nesting ground for birds like these ibises are limited to the shallow and fertile shores of the lake. Much of it is rocky and unfriendly to bird life. Bitter experience in other unspoiled parts of the world has shown that once man starts to plunder, he very soon ends up with a wildlife desert. The Indians would once have stalked these Andean geese with catapult. Today, more and more guns are finding their way to the lakeside, with the usual sad results. An immediate harvest, but eventual disappearance of the hunted. Titicaca has plenty of flamingos, yet even they could be threatened. They present large targets for the most inaccurate hunter. There's not much meat on the flamingo, but primitive people hunt for other reasons, usually magical ones. The flamingo's deep pink feathers are their undoing. Many Indians consider these to be a highly potent charm against evil. Possibly the only safe birds are migrants who use Titicaca as a staging post on their way to nesting grounds in North America. Wilson's fowler rope spin in gay abandon as they stir up the bottom mud looking for insects. is similar in both cases. But the Indians of Lake Titicaca dance with considerably less animation. Unlike the fallow rope, they are tied forever to their beautiful but harsh lakeside. But theirs is not the only part of the Andes that has its wildlife problems. South of Lake Titicaca, the country gets progressively more barren. There are few wild flowers, but one plant makes up for them all. Puya ramondii is a huge relative of the pineapple. It stands 25 feet high. The great plant takes 150 years to reach this size, blossoms once and then dies. It makes the very most of its once-in-a-lifetime flowering. With 8,000 separate blossoms, it's the largest flower spike in the world. It can even embarrass a hummingbird with the richness of nectar it offers. As you press southward from the Altiplano, the country slowly climbs until you're always above 16,000 feet. You're getting towards the Puna, the high desert where only a few large animals manage to exist. 
Small parties of Vicuna run for their lives. Even here, they've been hunted. An occasional rear, South America's equivalent of the ostrich, but no relation, steps it out at 20 miles per hour. Yet further south, the desert gives place to the most unearthly country of all. Nothing lives here among 5,000 square miles of pure salt. In fact, it's a 10-foot thick crust of salt floating on a lake over 1,000 feet deep. In prehistoric times, the climate here was vastly different. The strangely patterned salt desert was once a tropical inland sea. Arrowheads found on the shores show there were plenty of birds to hunt. Today, no birds can stand conditions so severe as this. But on the fringe of the salt desert, there are still birds and hunters using Stone Age methods to catch them. The men who hunt these birds are a tribe called the Chapaya. They fled to this awful place hundreds of years ago, knowing their enemies wouldn't cross the salt desert to attack them. Their soil is too salty to grow much, so they catch the occasional flamingos by hurling a bolas. The lead weights attached to leather thongs wind themselves round the flamingo's body. There are only 800 chipaya left. In this case, man has the survival problem, not wildlife. Southward of the Great Salt Desert, the plateau climbs again. What little grass there is fights a losing battle against perpetual frost. It is bitingly cold. It can also be boiling hot. The heat is not of the sun, but from the pent-up wrath of the volcanoes that once formed this region. Their fury now only finds relief in bubbling geysers. Here, the high Andes keep one of their most dramatic surprises. A miraculous lake. Laguna, Colorado. The Red Lake. If at first it doesn't seem to live up to its name, that's because its shores are frozen and its waves are white with foam from rich salt deposits. But in certain lights, its waters are bright orange. They're tinted by the algae, a food much loved by flamingos. At Laguna, Colorado, you find the rarest flamingo of all, the species known as James flamingo. It's hard to tell from the Andean flamingo, but it has redder legs and more yellow on the beak. This rare bird shares the Red Lake with the far more common Andean species. To enjoy the rich algae soup, they're willing to put up with the bitter cold and the inconvenience of having to tiptoe on ice. Since they were first discovered, the numbers of the rare James flamingo have dropped alarmingly. Today, fewer than 2,000 birds nest around the lake. Indians have known about Laguna, Colorado for hundreds of years, and few other travelers ever visit its desolate shores. So it's unlikely that mere disturbance has caused the decline in the birds' numbers. But flamingo eggs are large and full of nourishment. And this is probably why James Flamingo is now in some danger. Indian egg collectors have always raided the flamingo nesting colonies. But recently, the situation has changed. 100 miles away across the mountains in the neighboring state of Chile are growing mining towns where the eggs find a ready market. Each nesting season, Indians make the hazardous journey in snowstorms across the peaks from Chile. From Laguna, Colorado, and another small lake nearby, they take at least 25,000 flamingo eggs. Collecting is hard and often dangerous. So naturally, they take the eggs that are nearest the shore. They don't bother whether the eggs belong to common or rare species.
A good many eggs end up on the shoreline smashed, like this. But not the little Andean plovers. Her eggs are too small to be worthwhile. But the black and white Andean geese certainly don't escape. Andean avocets, like all the other birds, are attracted to this apparently hostile shoreline by the volcanic hot springs that keep the rich feeding water from freezing. But the Laguna Colorado's glory is its flamingos and they're the ones it is most in danger of losing. It would be a tragedy if they were ever driven away. Should its flamingos be drastically reduced, the Red Lake would become a dead world, like the spent volcanic cones that surround it. Not all the waters are salt, and by no means all the water birds are endangered. In the rocky streams that come roaring down from the high peaks lives one of the world's strangest ducks. These gaudy dandies with their red bills and garish stripes are torrent ducks. They're peculiar to the mountain rivers of South America. Within a few days of hatching, the young are perfectly able to look after themselves in the fiercest current. The chicks seem positively to enjoy the force of the water and often leave the shelter of a midstream rock to battle with the river's power. The mother bird sometimes appears anxious for her brood, despite their obvious ability to take care of themselves. The cock dives and swims upstream underwater past his mate. He's almost certainly looking for food, but he manages to give an impression of fatherly concern. Torrent ducks can fly perfectly well, but like the harlequin ducks of North America, they seem most at home battling a powerful stream. The ducklings find their food on the mossy boulders at the edges. When the youngsters want to move on, they don't wait for their parents, but launch out fearlessly. They appear almost to skate across the surface. A race up the rapids becomes a carefree game of tag. It seems impossible that the mountain wilderness of the Central Andes could ever be seriously threatened by the advance of civilization. Yet, from Lake Titicaca in the north to Laguna, Colorado in the south, the threats are already looming. Civilization could soon pollute a mountain river as clear as this. A new mining boom is on the way in Bolivia. Some streams will be dammed for electric power, others turn filthy with mine washings. The trouble about this whole country is that it lies on the borders of three states, Chile, Bolivia, Peru. None is exactly far advanced in its plans to protect wildlife. None agrees on the best ways to do it. Even such laws as have been passed are difficult to enforce in a land of desert and mountain 12,000 feet above sea level. It may seem overdramatic to sound a warning, but it's certainly not too early.
Hello, everybody. Um, I, that was the most astonishing film and amazingly percipient, it seems now, considering it was made in 1967. Um, and it was so interesting to see it after seeing all the hazards involved in filming and you know, getting stuck in the mud and unfriendly um, reception in some places. And I'm sure there are going to be loads of questions which you may have typed into the Q&A and we will try and fit in as many as we can. And you can use the raise hand button and unmute yourself if um, Alberto picks up on your hand. So are there any questions? Okay, I have Brian Moser who raise his hand. Uh, Brian, I'm going to give you the mic so you can raise your question now. You just need to unmute your mic. You have the mic now. Brian? Well, apparently he's not managing, but I have Rosemary Preston who also... Rosemary, you have the mic now, you, you, you can unmute. Greetings to all. Marion, that was just wonderful. Uh, the, our memories of the trip to Lipes was, are still alive. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I remember it too. <laughs> Just absolutely extraordinary. What Mary, I remember somewhere south of Uyuni, Tony stopped somewhere, a very dry valley, and produced three or four flint arrowheads that had been perfectly formed by Paleolithic Aymara. We still have them. And we still have them, of course. And David's reminding me. Um, the Laguna Colorado, we, we were dead impressed in the early morning, a fox, like an ordinary old fox, creeping down to the shore of the lake. Um, and my extraordinary unforeseen learning with our three or four month old baby in the Land Rover was hanging a string between the two vehicles to dry to what to hope the na nappies would dry in the morning <laughs> and find that they freeze dried and by the time the sun came up they were this soft muslin and we just it was just a good learning how things worked it was a fabulous trip <laughs> but do uh, rosemary do you actually remember that we woke up one morning and found ourselves actually surrounded by a group of militiamen yeah, and we were too, further north, just south of La Paz. Uh, yes, I do remember that. Yeah, and they were all armed, and it was a very uncomfortable situation for a short while. I remember that, and we'd had the same experience, um, I don't know, it was two or three hours south, between La Paz and Oruro, and we'd slept in the Pampa, and suddenly I saw a half-truck coming full of soldiers with guns. We opened the back of the Land Rover. David had a shotgun, which dot, dot, dot. Um, and I put the baby to my breast 
and these soldiers came along and we managed to persuade them that we were straight and yes probably we should have stopped in a village but that was the same the same trip yeah uh, and actually i suspect uh brian who was um i think probably has had a technical issue but uh brian of course was very much around at that time as well yeah because he was filming the the che guevara uh well the, you know when they brought uh guevara's body in and so on exactly exactly yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, they, they were fairly hairy times, really, weren't they? Uh, and we went to the where I can't remember the village where Che was. And that was really quite oh. scary when he was held. It was. Oh, yeah, I should remember it. Yeah, I can't remember, actually. Yeah. Yes. Kamiri, Kamiri. Kamiri, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Rosemary, for your questions. There is another coming from uh, That's a comment from David Trussi Franconi who said, Mario, Marion, you and Tony were way ahead of your time, a privilege to know you both. And seeing the, the, the film that was made in the 60s and what is happening today, I can say that you were uh, yeah. way ahead on, on the time. Yes, I think so. Yeah, it was, I mean, obviously World Wildlife Fund had been founded at that time. So, you know, people were very conscious of the problem then. Yeah, there is another question here from Peter, who says, hi, Marion, any chance of seeing the film Treasures of Chukisaka sometime in the future? <laughs> Probably that's a question to, to you, obviously. Is, is, might I ask, is that Peter Williams? I think so. It's, he's just the uh, same as Peter, but I suspect it's him. Oh, he's, he's coming in from Canada. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember, you can raise your hands or or send your questions uh, through the Q and A. In the meantime, a little bit following from what David uh, Trusi Franconi his comments, I, I will ask you, Marian, did you manage later uh, after you these films? Did you came ever came back to Bolivia and see any change changes or anything, or oh. that was the only time that you were there? No, we we were in and out of Bolivia a lot over all those years, uh, you know, of the whole fifty years. I think Tony almost probably was there. Um, well, I don't know. I, I can't really say how many times, but you know, constantly. Yes, we were there. And yes, of course, there were huge changes. And um, the most obvious one, I think, was uh, El Alto. The, you know, the entire growth of, of the city above La Paz. You say something about Tony. Mm. I mean, that, you, you know, that, that. Sorry. Um, that I mean, in our day, you you could drive across the Altiplano and you arrived, and there was the bowl and La Paz and the lights and nothing on the rim outside, just the airport. Um, but nowadays, of course, it is, a, what, a city of two million? Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like huge. Yeah. yeah, absolutely huge. Um, but the, in the Salt Lake area, down in the Salas, I mean, obviously many more tourists and so on now. Um, but I, I don't think that's changed so, so dramatically. I have now Baroness Hooper, who is raising her hand. It's a real honor to have her. So, Baroness, uh, you have the mic. Go ahead, please. Thank you. And thank you so much. It's been a real privilege to be able to um, see this film. Um, and for me, uh, it brings back a, a lot of memories because I was first there at Lake Titicaca in 1966. So I'm amazed that our paths didn't cross, um, but I was actually traveling on down through South America after my academic year in Quito with a postgraduate fellowship. And, and so um, uh, it's made me long to, I, I have been back, I, I must say, and um, uh, was able to visit Margaret Anstey uh, there, um, but um, <clears throat> Uh, it, it makes me want to go back again because <laughs> I feel as if I missed uh, so many things. Uh, and, and I wonder, uh, first of all, how often are you able to show this film 
um, uh, because it is so interesting and, and, and the whole conservation message uh, from so long ago is, is so important. And when was the last time you were there? <laughs> oh my well, as starting backwards, um, the last time we were there was in 2013. Um, and that was, uh, you know, 50 years since we met. So that's why, in a sense, oh, yes. did sorry, that. you said no, that. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. But I'm, I'm delighted you mentioned Margaret Anstey because, of course, um, she and she effectively was my boss when I went out as a volunteer because she was the United Nations rep at that stage, wasn't she? Yes. Uh, and she did so much for Bolivia, actually, yes. and in so very many ways. Um, and sorry, what was the middle question? Um, I remember Margaret at the beginning, and had we been back, oh, how, how, how often are you able to show this oh, film? film? Because it's been such um, a privilege for us. Well, this is almost a beginning in a way. Um, after Tony died, somebody put to me the idea of creating my own YouTube channel. And so that gave me um, the opportunity to put these films up on that YouTube channel. And so hence, when I sent them out to odd friends, and I think Alan Shave in particular is responsible for this, um, he has sort of sent the link on to other people. And that, that is the way that it has actually come into the anglo Bluean society now. Um, I'm not quite sure, other than through the society, how one would actually show the, these, uh, these films. Um, I mean, it might well be worth showing Treasures of Chukizaka again, because obviously that hasn't been seen for some time. Um, maybe maybe Winston and I can have a chat. Mm. But I mean, is, is the embassy aware of it? I, 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 I know we don't have an ambassador at the moment, but, um, you know, have, 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 uh, I'm sure they'd be fascinated. Uh, well, for, I, 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 as far as I know, they don't know about it, but maybe Winston knows more than I do. Yeah, there's, um, the head of mission at the moment is, is the consul. Uh, there isn't an ambassador yet, but we'd be delighted to show the treasures of, uh, of uh, Ochukisaka. We also wanted to show uh, Lizzie, but Lizzie's now been made available to everybody who attended today. And also, I'd like to mention you can get the book. Um, uh, uh, that was written by by uh, by Tony and uh, two ladies that were co-producers, uh, co-writers of the of the book. It's called Lizzie, and it is the letters that that, that Lizzie sent to her parents when she was traveling uh, up the Amazon to try to get to Orton, um, where there was a rubber boom at the time, and she, her husband was working for the Vacadies family. And actually, of course, there is a book of Land Above the Clouds, although it was. Obviously yes. published very many moons ago, but it's, yeah. Well, I hope it's in the Canning Library, which is now based in King's College, London. But the book certainly went to the Canning Library uh, when it was in Belgrave Square. Square. Oh, yeah. good. Well, I'm sure it's still in the collection then. Yes, and I, I think, you know, other books that Tony wrote um, are also in the library, yes. Oh, good. Yeah, because he... he <laughs> He did quite a lot on the um, the Nazca lines in Peru. Ah. Lizzie can be obtained via Amazon, and it's uh, I I've got a signed copy uh, quite recently for three pound fifty, <laughs> and in excellent condition. <laughs> and we do. Marion we said, do not. I haven't got a sign. Marion, you told me you didn't. Have, you haven't got a signed copy. Well, you know, no, and we and we, we, we don't we don't get royalties either. Oh, no. can no. can oh, go ahead, Gate. Can I just say that uh, in case anybody's listening and thinks, hey, I haven't got a link to this yet, we are planning to send it together with the recording of this <laughs> event. So you'll get both at the same time. So, so it is coming, but it hasn't come yet. That, that's really for members of the society, isn't it? Well, no, that's for everybody who's applied for a link. Oh, right. OK. So, um, you know, everybody will get Lizzie and um and tonight's uh, tonight's film and can i can i just ask you a question i i think it flashed past in the credits but was the music by johnny dankworth yes yes wow. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> oh, they, they did things well in those days you know <laughs> no expense spare <laughs> no uh, the anglo survival series was very successful 
Um, but yeah, there was a problem with with Andean wildlife because it just really didn't stand up to American, uh, uh, sorry, African wildlife. Um, so most of the programs, I think, that Anglia did came out of Africa. So. I remind everybody, uh, you can raise your, send your questions via the Q&A button or uh, raise your hands. Let's give some time to people to ask their questions or any comment that you would like to, to send. We have Alan Shafe who is raising his hand. Alan, you have the mic. Look, thank you very much, Marion, for the presentation and for the uh, publicity for Shave Enterprises. Uh, yes. Yes, I the link to quite a lot of people around the world. So it looks like you've beaten my numbers for the Anglo-Bolivian Society presentation. I, you've beaten me. I believe we have. I believe we have. That's shameful, shameful on you. Well, uh, listening, to Rosemary, listening to Rosemary and thinking of the uh, Puyo Raimundi and knowing that Peter is probably somewhere out there, it was with the Prestons that we went to the Comanche Mountain with Tony and the Prestons and climbed that hill. It was easy going up, but Peter had to help me down. I couldn't get back down without risking my neck. But I had the lovely recollection of Rosemary. She mentioned the nappies, yes. She forgot to mention that the bay was swung in a hammock in the back of the Land Rover. Right. No, it's gone. Yeah, it <laughs> looks like there is some streaming problems with Bolivia. <laughs> <laughs> Bolivia very special, always. <laughs> and the shades are still here. That's good. It Marion, anything yep. you would like to add? No, I mean, it's just wonderful, actually, that so many people have actually asked to see the film and, and have tuned in with us tonight, which is, you know, absolutely brilliant. I think Tony would be extremely chuffed, should we say. He'd be very pleased. I'm happy. <laughs> uh, we are the ones who are very pleased to, to enjoy this magnificent film and hear you all your experience as well. I don't know if you have any information about that, but Anna from Spain has been asking uh, uh, how is the population of the in, then endangered flam flamingos doing now? Uh, I don't know if you have some information about that. Not really. I, I think the only thing that um, Tony observed over time was that quite a number of the James flamingos had actually moved from the Laguna Colorado and had gone further north. Um, but much more than that, I, I really can't, I don't know. Um, I'm sure actually if, if Anna probably looked it up online, there's more information there really. Um, so sorry, I can't, I, you know, that's it's not, I, I can't really help on that one. Um, There is another uh, question from Roy Horrex, who says, a question for Marion. What do you think are the biggest changes in Bolivia since you first went there in the 1960s? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think, as I said, um, El Alto, the, you know, the city above La, pa above La Paz was, um, for me, the biggest change. But obviously, um, La Paz itself. Uh, you know, in, in our day, there were no high rises. I think the Copacabana Hotel down on the, the Prado was about the tallest building, maybe the university as well. Uh, but since that time, obviously, the, you know, the buildings have changed. And then again, 
uh, all the sides to the, the city, um, there was, they were relatively uninhabited. But now, obviously, you know, people have got homes going right up to the very top of the rim of the valley, of the, uh, this, of the La Paz Valley. Um, the population has obviously grown enormously. Um, what more can I add? Um, I think, I, I've said for me, I think the last time I was actually in the area of Lipes and the, the Sala was probably about 1990. Uh, so that is even, you know, that's quite a while ago, um, even to try and remember. But I think, you know, basically everywhere, every place, you just felt that uh, the population had grown um, and certainly tourism was much more on the rise. And even if I think of places like Aurora and, you know, in our day, I think it was almost all one story housing. Um, that, too, has changed, you know, hugely as well. Uh, and of course, then there's Santa Cruz. Um, it was a, a mud rut, very, very small town, um, almost, you know, horses um, outside balcony buildings, very few vehicles. Uh, but that has, you know, Santa Cruz has just grown exponentially, hasn't it? Um, it's absolutely huge now. Um, isn't it? It is Bolivia's largest city, isn't it? Now, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, probably much the same as in, in most countries, really, the, you know, population, a lot of poverty, sadly. Um, yeah, well, that's probably about it, I think. Well, Marion, we really appreciate all your input here. Uh, I don't see any more question for the moment, but Kate, I, I just uh, have a Winston. question. Go ahead, please. Yeah, as we're going to we're going to distribute the the film Lizzie, which is longer. Um, I I just wondered if you could just comment on 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 that on that film on Lizzie. On Lizzie. Um, yeah, if you could just comment because it's quite a, it's quite a, and it, I mean the story itself, the, the the letters that were being sent back, but the way it was filmed, it was filmed. You had uh, you had Maria Aitken uh, th that was participating uh, in, in 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 the film as a comment as a commentary. So yeah. could you just tell us a little bit about the film and uh, and the, the challenges you faced? Uh, um, because you followed the route, didn't you? Well, Lizzie, um, it, that that came about because um, her great niece inherited her letters um, and didn't really quite know what to do with them, and so she approached John Hemming. Um, and John said, you know, get in touch with Tony because he knows the area. So Tony worked with Anne Brown and her friend, another Annie. Um, and the BBC took on the, um, the idea. Uh, and they certainly they did a recce first. But the, the journey was quite extraordinary. This is 1896. And she was a young girl from London who married a, a German. Um, and they were setting off for him to take over a rubber plantation on the River Oton in the Bolivian Amazon. And the journey, I mean, just turned out to be quite horrendous, really. It, it lasted for 14 months. And they set out, I think I seem to remember, from Liverpool and made their way to Belém at the mouth of the Amazon. Uh, and you can imagine, you know, just how hot um, and uncomfortable it all was. And this was a young Victorian girl still with, you know, corsets and all the big dresses and, and so on. Um, and as they then went uh, further up the Amazon and into the tributaries, uh, they, they got involved with the, the rubber baron, Nicolas Suarez um, and Vaca Diaz, uh, who were kings of the, the rubber in the Beni region. Um, and they, they also, uh, there was a big accident actually in, in which one of them died, Vaca Diaz died. Uh, but um, there's one, one part of the film which is really quite extraordinary because uh, in order to get through the river system from one river to another, they had to, to carry the boats over a passage of land. Um, and that passage of land became known as the Fitzcarald Isthmus or the Isthmus of, of Fitzcarald. Um, 
and it, it's just an adventurous story and I, I won't give away the end I think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but so the the actual this, film, is the, this is the book that's the book that's our Lizzie yep and uh, I think the actual filming um I don't know for some reason to do maybe with equity or something Maria Riker could uh, Maria Aitken could take part but couldn't actually play Lizzie so it's a Brazilian actress who's playing Lizzie, but Maria Aitken is doing all the talking. Anyway, it's a nice film to watch. My great grandmother went to Uruguay as a young bride with her husband who had been given the job of, as a director of the waterworks in Uruguay. But she, she went with my grandmother and my great aunt as babies in wonderfully ornate perambulators and but she couldn't cope with it because of the snakes and I was clearing out my father's studio and I found a tiny little South American pistol which presumably she kept on her at all times to shoot snakes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well with with this magnificent introduction I think we can to a close to the, to the webinar. Kate, do you have the last words, please? Thank you very well, much. I am to say thank you very, very much for letting us show the film and for giving us the sort of insight into the, oh, the very hazardous <laughs> um, uh, things you encountered as you were filming. It, it, it was enthralling and the film was wonderful. And I very much enjoyed it. And it, it's interesting to see that rather gruesome episode of the condor on the back of the bull, bull because I doubt if that would get past. Mm. No, no, quite. <laughs> anyway, it's been a, a real pleasure. No, I'm so pleased we've been able to show it and just, just hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And until yeah. the next time. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Alberto. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Karen. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.